Today we have here with us Kate Roberts. She is a leader in the Pre-Med Scenes Pre-Health Journal Club, and she is a non-traditional pre-med who has worked in HR, and she has a master's in biomedical sciences, and she is also applying to medical school in this cycle. So Kate, you can take it away. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dia. Yeah, so I'll give you guys a little bit of my background. Um, I work at a private practice right now, which is a retina practice, so a subspecialty of ophthalmology. Um, I'll give you kind of a quick and dirty what we do in retina, and there'll be a section for questions there about that. Um, and then I'm going to tell you guys kind of the things that I'm interested in, some of the things I've done, like not like lab research in, but just, you know, unofficially your own research in, um, which sounds bad, but you'll know what I mean when I get to the And then there'll be a section for questions at the end there as well. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I would just like to let you guys know that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube shortly after. And I will also give you guys the link to some of these, these this slideshow because there's some resources here that you guys may want to access. Okay, I'm, I'm Kate. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I work with Christina, who's here. Hi, Christina, in the Pre-Med Seed Journal Club. Um, this is me and my parents. Um, only child, they're great. Just a, you know, fun picture. Um, my education. I have a BS in pre-physical therapy with a minor in performance studies from Pensacola Christian College Tiny School in Panhandle of Florida, about 4,500 students. Um, that middle picture is a show that I did some of the costuming for, so just a fun fact there. Um, like Dia said, I have a master's in sciences, um, biomedical sciences from Liberty. Um, I did some post back non degree classes because I was pre physical therapy and not pre med um, from Oregon State while I was working full time. And I'm currently a scribe at a private practice retina clinic. I'm applying to an MPH for program for this fall um, and an MD program for next fall. So what is retina. Um, retina is a subspecialty of ophthalmology, meaning that retina specialists have gone to medical school, an ophthalmology residency, and then a vitreo retina fellowship. The four leading causes of blindness or low vision are age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, and glaucoma. Our clinic's bread and butter conditions are age-related macular degeneration or AMD and diabetic retinopathy. We also mainly treat retinal detachments, blood vessel occlusions in the eye and some other conditions. Um, cataracts and glaucoma, we don't necessarily manage in clinic. Um, cataracts is the front part of the eye. So we're just mainly dealing with that back chamber. Glaucoma, we sometimes treat, but that's another kind of front of the eye problem. So what we treat at the bottom here, these scans are called OCT scans. It's an ocular CT. So when you look at the back of the eye, um, this is the fovea, that dip in your central vision. So you'll see this far left, this is a normal OCT. So you see that little dip in the middle, that's totally normal. Do you see this kind of faint line on the edges out there? That's where the jelly in your eye is attaching to that back layer of your retina. And then there's just the different layers of the retina here. And we're going to talk about what the middle and the right slide, what's going on there. So age-related macular degeneration. So in this condition, it's age-related, obviously. There's fatty deposits. They're just like leaking out of your blood vessels. Like you might have a, a blood vessel plaque in another area of the body. They're leaking out into the layers of the retina. We call them drusen, and they accumulate in that retina. That's what you're seeing in that middle picture right there, those bumps, that's those fatty deposits underneath the retina. And this does disturb their vision. 90% of patients just have these deposits and we call that dry AMD. 10% of those patients progress to wet AMD. So because of these blood, because of these deposits, excuse me, um, there's some decrease in the blood flow to the retina. And whenever you have decreased blood flow somewhere, your body tries to compensate, right? Homeostasis. So in order to compensate your blood, your body grows new blood vessels, but these blood vessels are not the same quality as the other blood vessels in your eye. They're leaky and they leak out fluid and sometimes blood into the retina. And that's what you're seeing on the right. 
you can kind of see like the layers are really disturbed. There's no dip in the middle. There's all these pockets of fluid on the top and on the bottom in between all of these layers. And this is called macular edema. Edema, like any other place in your body, macula just being that specific part of the retina. And all of these things in your retina, whether it's the bumpy deposits or whether it's this fluid, when they disturb those layers of the retina, they disturb vision. And this specifically, the macula is responsible for your central vision. So you'll see people who have distortions. They'll say, when I look at uh, power lines down the road, they're not straight or the lines of the road aren't straight. Or when I try to read, there's a spot missing or there's a spot that's gray or black. That's kind of the symptoms we see. Um, treatment for this, if you're dry, you don't have those new blood vessels and all those pockets of fluid on the right. If you're the middle picture, your treatment's lifestyle and A-REDS vitamins. Lifestyle meaning blood pressure, cholesterol, um, eating leafy greens, taking care of yourself and not picking up smoking. Smoking actually, it's crazy to go from the middle picture to the picture on the right. If you smoke, your chances are increased by 400%. So that's huge. Um, blood pressure and cholesterol also being a big factor there. And then AREDS vitamins. Um, we're gonna talk about vitamins a lot later, but this is actually one of the few vitamins that are like clinically tested, wonderful for you. These are vitamins that slow the progression of AMD by 25%, which is pretty cool. Um, and then wet macular degeneration, that picture on the right with the new blood vessels, that is also the AREDS vitamins, you keep shaking that, and then anti-VEGF injections. So you think about this wet AMD on the right with all those blood vessels. So the treatment for that is to stop that blood vessel growth and kind of dry up that area. So we do that with injections into the eye, and they're anti-VEGF. VEGF is an endothelial growth factor in blood vessels. It's the same drug that's used for some tumors, for cancerous tumors, which is cool. I like to tell a lot of our patients that they're getting the same drug that we use for glioblastoma. That's our most common drug, Avastin, which is pretty neat. Um, and it binds to that VEGF and it neutralizes it. So that signal to keep growing blood vessels is gone there. And that works pretty well for a lot of our patients more of what we treat, diabetic retinopathy. So high levels of sugar in the blood damage those blood vessels in the eye. They can cause hemorrhages. If the disease progresses, you get that same kind of a thing. Decreased blood vessel to the eye, new blood vessel growth. And again, there's like a stage before you have blood vessels and then a stage where you're having blood vessels and swelling. So if you wanna think about it in the terms of AMD, dry is called non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or NPDR. And then when you start having those blood vessels and that leaking again, it can progress to proliferative. So proliferating new blood vessels, diabetic retinopathy or PDR. And that's kind of the wet version if you wanna think about it that way. Treatment for this is laser in the periphery of the eye. There's a lot of like microaneurysms and hemorrhages out there and that seals those little blood vessels, but it causes some vision loss in the periphery. The goal of this is to try to stop the spread of the damage before it gets to their central vision in the middle of their eye from those leaky vessels to keep it from continuing. And like we talked about the same edema that fluid collects in really the same way as age-related macular degeneration. And we also treat that with anti-VEGF injections. There's a couple other options for diabetic retinopathy once you get a little bit more advanced, but this is kind of your mainstays. Okay, some pictures. This is a diabetic eye. These are fundus photos. So if you put a camera, a really good quality, right up to a dilated eye and shown light in, this is what you're gonna see. In the very center, you see that dark spot in the normal retina on the left. That is your macula and fovea. That's responsible for your central vision. To the right of that, on, still on the normal retina, you see this kind of like a, a disc that's kind of glowing and then there's blood vessels coming out of it. That's your optic nerve and your optic disc, all your blood vessels. So this would be the patient's right eye and all of this is coming out from there. This is normal, this is healthy, this is what it's supposed to look at. Diabetic eye on the right, diabetic eyes look very sick. Whenever you see pictures of them, you can just kind of tell right away all of these hemorrhages, all of these fatty deposits that are out there. Some of these may be drusen, some of them might be some other proteins just kind of hanging out, but a lot of bleeding that you see here. 
And this is another diabetic eye. You can see a big hemorrhage here, new blood vessels growing on that optic disc. And there's some laser scars in the periphery. We call it PRP. It's panretinal photocoagulation. So it coagulates those blood vessels, seals them off, and you'll get these little really characteristic scars from those laser pulses. The next picture is a picture of somebody getting an injection in their eye. So if you don't want to see that, this is your chance to look away. This is something we do in clinic a lot. Um, I prep the patient for this. We probably do a hundred of these a week easily. And um, like I said, this is a treatment for diabetic retinopathy and AMD. So it's very common. It's also a treatment for a couple other things. It solves a lot of our problems. And also here, A1C control is huge for diabetics, smoking and blood pressure again. This is what you do for a retinal detachment. So on the left side here, you see that retinal tear that they're pointing to. This is a pneumatic, pneumatic, think of like the word for air, like pneumonia. Um, you inject a gas bubble into there and that pushes the retina back up against there until it seals. Um, depending on where the tear is in the eye, the patient might have to do some positioning when they sleep or during the day to keep that bubble in place. You can imagine with this person, they would need to kind of sleep facing down um, to keep that bubble from, you know, if you laid on your back, it would kind of float to the back of the eye. So it's like a level, like a carpenter's level. You've got to keep that bubble up there. And then slowly that gust bubble will dissipate away into the eye as it heals. Um, on the right, there's a scleral buckle. So kind of the whole idea with a retinal detachment is that there's too much pressure pulling into the eye. Um, there's something pulling away. Usually it's the vitreous pulling away from the retina. And so there's this traction, this tension in between the two. So the idea is to kind of put pressure from this side or fr pressure from this side to kind of join those two halves back together. Scleral buckles are used sometimes, that's the top right here. And they just put a buckle around the outside of the eye, um, kind of like behind where your eyelids are back in there. And that kind of pushes on the sides of the retina and so that tear can kind of go back up. Another choice, depending on what kind of tear you've got and what the specialist sees is a vitrectomy. So the vitreous is the jelly in the big portion of your eye, and that can sometimes be what's pulling on your eye. So we can take that out. And if that's what's causing your problems, then that'll fix it. Okay, what are floaters? A lot of people have a question about this. Floaters are clumps in your vitreous, which is that jelly in the back of your eye that we were just talking about. They are generally benign. If you have floaters, I have had floaters for my entire life. I have a huge one in this eye that has been driving me crazy lately and one in this eye as well. Um, they're no big deal. A bunch of new floaters can indicate a, a retinal detachment. And if you think about that, so a lot of retinal detachments are caused by this jelly, this vitreous coming away from the back of the retina. So if it's pulling apart, you can think it'd probably be easy for clumps to form there. So if somebody has a whole bunch of new floaters, that can mean a retinal detachment. But generally, a few, if they're not changing, not a concern. More frequently, this is what we just talked about, it indicates a PVD or a posterior vitreous detachment. So as we age, the jelly in the back of our eye liquefies and it pulls away from the retina in the back. Um, and a lot of the times that doesn't cause any problems. It doesn't always cause a retinal detachment. In fact, most of the time it doesn't. It typically causes floaters because you think that jelly's pulling away, it's being disturbed, you can make clumps easily. And that's when we see a lot of patients for the first time. I have so many new floaters. My eye is so weird, you know, what's going on? Um, but we always want to check it to make sure that they don't have a retinal detachment since that's happened. If the floaters are so numerous and dense that the patient's activities are difficult, then they can be surgically removed. We're not talking about one or five. We're talking about they're so dense that they can't see what they're doing. Um, and they're having trouble with certain daily activities. So that is a possibility. Other things that we see in clinic, um, retinopathy of prematurity, premature babies, their retinas are not completely developed, um, papilledema, glaucoma, vas vessel occlusions, ischemic neuropathy, pseudotumor. I'll let you look any of these up that you want. Some interesting stuff. Um, because we are a subspecialty of ophthalmology, I think we get some more interesting things. Um, 
And then at the very bottom here is a really great website if you're interested in ophthalmology, iGuru. It is a ophthalmology residency crash course, but it has like flashcards with all the imaging and all kinds of really good, like quick and dirty summaries of everything. And they also have a translator here for ophthalmology notes, as you will know or come to know, ophthalmology notes are just man famous for their abbreviations. You can see some on this page even, but we have abbreviations galore and nobody knows what they mean. <laughs> so this translator, you can put an ophthalmology note in and it'll translate it to you to the words that it's an abbreviation for. So what do I do? Um, our clinic works like kind of like a conveyor belt. Our front of clinic does workups. A workup text gets a patient's HPI, so their history of present, present illness, what's going on. I update their medical history. What surgeries are you, have you had? What medications are you on? Who are your doctors? Get your vitals. And in ophthalmology, your vitals are visual acuity. So you're looking at that chart that we all know with the letters on it, telling you what it says. Um, the intraocular pressure, this is a screening for glaucoma. And that's what this tool in the very bottom right hand is. This is a tono pin. It's got a little tiny, um, a little tiny piece in the middle of a circle, kind of like this, that sticks out like a little uh, column in the middle. And that bounces against the eye and it gets the pressure in the front. Uh, we dilate the patient, obviously, got to see the whole eye. And we get everybody's blood pressure because you saw in the first couple slides, blood pressure is a big deal to your retina. Um, after the workup, the patient gets any ordered testing. So like those OCTs that we saw or those fundus photos is what we call it, just a picture of the back of the eye. There's some other more fancy things we do as well. And then after they've sat dilated for a while, they go to a back room and a scribe updates anything in the chart, looks at the doctor's plan from last time and says, you know, did you follow up with this sleep study? That's something we get a lot of our patients to do. Did you get this carotid ultrasound? Have you talked to your glaucoma specialist? How is your pressure? Have you talked to your surgeon for your next cataract surgery? Updating all of that. Then the doctor comes in and we have a template of each part of the eye for each eye. And she is at the slit lamp doing the exam, shining the bright light into their eye, seeing their eye and saying, this is what I see. And I type it into the computer as she goes. And then she tells me, hey, I want them to go get this appointment. I want them to do this study. And I wanna see them back in this many months. And then she goes to the next patient and we kind of wrap it up and get it ready for him, for her, for the next patient. Um, Opso is a great, patient care job. Um, you have a lot of direct patient care hours. Um, I really enjoy it. And it does not require certifications, at least here, some workplaces might, but kind of an easy in. Um, I think there was on another slide, but I didn't mention it. One thing that we don't do in clinic is test for glasses because we are specifically retina, a normal ophthalmologist might. Um, so the next section is not about eyes at all. So if you have any questions about retina, this is your chance. So I have a question, Kate. Yeah. So um, your retina clinic is really fascinating. Now, do you witness, do you witness surgery? Is there like a surgical suite or? I don't. Um, so okay. she does her surgeries. Well, some of them. Um, she does most of her surgeries over at the hospital nearby. We are like literally right around the corner from one of our main hospitals. Um, so she'll go in and anything that she needs to do under anesthesia, she does there. But we okay. do have um, a cryo on site and we have a laser on site. So if she needs to do lasers and she doesn't need to put them to sleep, yeah, we do those on site. Wow. Um, laser, you have to have like specific equipment to be in the room so you're not damaging your eyes or anything like that. But yeah, she's she's pretty quick about it. She's really efficient. She's really good at it. She's pretty cool to watch. Wow, that's neat. Thanks. That's a, yeah. That seems really great. Anybody else before we move on? It's going to be a real code switch okay. to a totally different topic. So yeah, what ahead. do you think about blue light glasses in preventing? Oh, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> that's actually, yeah, that's, that's totally fake. It's not real at all. Yeah, it's not real at all. It's just a clever marketing trick. That's funny because that is on one of my later slides, even though it has nothing to do with eyes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so totally different tone switch. What do I want to do? 
not ophthalmology. Sorry. It's a great job. I love working there. It's, it's not what I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in health behaviors and the fight against pseudoscience and misinformation. Um, maybe the psychology behind why people choose alternative medicine and pseudoscience, especially people who are well-educated, especially people who come from a STEM background, like why do nurses, why do doctors, why do, you know, people with PhDs believe this kind of stuff. And kind of what Tina and I are doing now, and I have my own personal journal club, but I want students to know the difference between good and bad sources and predatory journals because this is something I was never taught and just kind of had to figure out along the way. This is a quote I love from my favorite book that I'm gonna tell you about later. Because the truth is there's no such thing as conventional or alternative or complementary or integrative or holistic medicine. There's only medicine that works and medicine that doesn't. And kind of to explain behind this, if something comes from a natural setting and it's effective, then we do clinical trials on it and we turn it into traditional medicine. If it doesn't work, it stays in conventional, uh, alternative, complementary, et cetera. It stays there. It just doesn't work or it's not safe. Think about over the years, so many of our drugs have come from plants, but I'm not gonna go give a, a heart failure patient foxglove. Like I'm not going to take the flowers and the leaves and give them that because that's not a good dosing thing. I'm going to give them digitalis instead because it's specific, it's dosed, but I mean, they're the same thing, right? So it makes sense. If something works, it goes into testing and it becomes a very specific thing. If it doesn't, it stays in that realm. So what is mis misinformation? This information is my, in my opinion, is the largest public health crisis facing the US and some other countries today. It is a spectrum. It goes all over the place. It affects everybody in different ways. It's a patient with low socioeconomic status who is not taught how to properly manage their disease, who is taught, you know, maybe a diabetic who doesn't know that bread equals carbs and carbs equals sugar, right? Maybe they're not taught that. Um, or maybe it's a company that's saying, this is a diet food and a diabetic thinks, oh, great, that works for me, you know? Or it's all the way up to professionals, like we talked about, believing pseudoscientific and conspiratorial claims. It affects everybody in a little bit of a different way. So this is basically what we just said, you know, diabetics not receiving nutritional counseling. And think about that pharmacist who um, over this last year purposefully destroyed those COVID vaccines. Like, how do you get to that point? Regardless of the manifestation, the root is the same. People are not properly equipped with the skills to critically evaluate the claims around them. So predatory journals is a big thing, especially with you guys, people who have a background in science. So in the sciences, there are countless predatory journals. When journals went from printed to online, um, and even possibly before that, there was this push to, um, give me just one second. I need to change my laptop charger. It is gonna come out of the thing. Give me just one moment. Okay, sorry about that. There we go. So they went through this push to, um, they had like these publishing fees and they told the people who were submitting to the journal. So you're thinking, I created an article, I send it to a journal. The journal says, you have to pay us to publish it, which first of all is ridiculous um, because you know, these journal articles, like these, these journals, you pay to subscribe to them. So they should use those profits to cover the cost of publishing your journal. No, it's ridiculous. It's a pay to publish system. But people around the world who were looking for a quick buck saw this as an opportunity to make money. And they use this pay to publish model to say, send us your journals and they pretend to do peer review. They really just publish anything. You pay them, they publish it. There's no peer review. There's no checking up on it. They just make money off of them. And this unfortunately means that on the internet, in journal articles, there's proof to back up nearly any claim, which is dangerous. 
This was originally kind of brought to light by Jeffrey Beal. Um, he cataloged a list of the offenders. Uh, there are a couple websites with lists, and this is one of the best ones that I use, predatoryjournals.com, and there's an index with all the journals there. They're frequently like one word off from a real journal. So like you think about the Lancet is a really like common, famous one. Um, if you weren't familiar with that, if it was like the International Lancet, you know, something like that, something you would think they'd be suing for copyright over, right? It's just so similar, like the International Journal of Spine or Spine International, like it's that similar. Um, and they sound legitimate because of that. If I don't recognize a journal, I check it. That's pretty much all there is to it. Um, and then there's other ways you can spot to see if it's good or bad research, but this is a much quicker way to kind of filter them out. Um, so how do you spot bad research? What are they comparing against? So let's say I'm doing a study of elderberry for the flu, okay? Am I comparing it against nothing? Am I comparing it against um, what we normally treat for the flu? Because those are two very different things. Um, how does the effect of elderberry compare to the effect of how we normally treat the flu? You see where I'm going with there? It's really easy to say elderberry helped the flu when you compared it against nothing, right? And another question um, is, would this condition have gotten better without treatment. Um, so the flu, I mean, you pretty much you recover or I mean, a few people do die from the flu, but in general, you're going to recover. So you, there's no way to say that that effect is tied to just elderberry if you're comparing it against nothing. Does that make sense? So also anything that with complementary, you know, alternative, integrative, holistic or CAM, which is complementary and alternative medicine in the title, that's pretty much a trigger warning. This is not gonna be good. Who funded the study? This is huge. Whose money is pushing this research? Um, and is the sample size big enough? Um, is it just a few people? Is a lot of people? Does it represent the population? Like the population of the United States, let's say our, our um, paper is saying this, um, intervention is good for the population of the United States, but they only trialed it on 16 year old females. Are there only 16 year old females in the entire US? No. So you can only apply that result to the people you tested it on. And that's why you want a big sample size that's reflective of the population that you're trying to establish this in. Um, and this is what we talked about. Was Were you just as likely to improve without treatment? So here's some triggers if you believe any of this, I don't want to make anybody mad, um, but these are some of the things that I have learned over the years um, that I used to believe in. I used to think they were legitimate, that they were evidence-based, and um, it's really kind of terrifying when you find it all out because there is so much just like preying on fears of people. Um, people get really scared and uncomfortable when science can give them a guarantee. And the problem is that is the nature of science and that is what makes science so good. So we can't get rid of that because the, the point of science and the scientific method is to continually to critically evaluate something to say, do we need to add more to this? Is this wrong? Can we prove this? Is, what does the evidence say? And you know, really critically evaluate things and not say 100% unless we know 100%. And frequently we can't get there, right? We can get to 99 a lot of the times, but we can't say for sure. And people don't like that. So it's very easy for a company to, company to say, this will X, Y, Z. This will cure you. This will 100%. That makes people feel safe when they are so much less safe with that option. So these are some of the biggest ones. Chiropractic. Chiropractic has limited evidence, limited evidence of improvement in lower back pain. The safety of chiropractic is under intense scrutiny. One of the problems with a lot of these areas, and if you get into this, you'll hear this a lot more, 
chiropractic, naturopathy, all of these people, when they're brought, like, why aren't there journal articles on this stuff? They'll say, you can't see it when you do studies, but I see it in when I treat people. That's not data. That's, that's made up. It's not really working if you can't see it in a study. Or they'll do studies themselves and they're so poorly designed that they don't prove anything. Um, and we'll get to it later, but chiropractors are just not trained in like traditional science enough to even really know half the time. They don't know what they don't know. Um, chiropractic manipulations have caused stroke and death. Um, you can look into this. There's people who have gone to the chiropractor, gotten an adjustment and like died a few days later from a stroke. People who have been permanently disabled from it. The neck should never ever be manipulated. It should never ever be popped. Your vertebral artery runs through that spine and you risk rupturing that artery and having a stroke and dying. Those are, I, I'm not sure if there's another correlation with stroke, but the ones that I know about, it's that vertebral artery. And the thing is you can't ever say like, is it a really low chance of that happening? Because chiropractors aren't letting people come in and study this. That's the problem here. Children also should never be manipulated, um, like full stop. Chiropractors do not get the same doctoral level STEM education as other professionals. While they are well-meaning, they do not know, they are generally completely unaware of the gaps in their education. They are taught a lot of pseudoscience, including meridians, applied kinesiology, alkaline diet, all of these things completely outside of their scope that they have no idea about. The only chiropractor I'm okay with is if it's a chiropractor who's willing to listen to other medical professionals and try to better themselves um, and is not giving advice outside of the really narrow scope of joints. They should not be giving you any information on diet. They should not be telling you to take any supplements. None of that. They are not qualified for any of that. Better, if you can, find a DO physician in your area that practices OMM and can adjust your spine and your other joints because they know what they're doing or go to physical therapy. Um, you don't want to risk injuring a joint. Physical therapists know your joints a whole lot better. Naturopathy and homeopathy. So a lot of people think that naturopathy and homeopathy are harmless. It's kind of the idea. They think it's natural, like it's a watered down version of like a drug, like it's a, you know, it's safe. In some cases, this is correct. But you've got to remember that natural does not mean good, safe, or better at all. Like if I went out to a lake and I took a cup and I scooped up some water, and in this hand I had a glass of filtered water, which one do you want to drink? <laughs> the filtered water, right? You want the thing that's been purified, you know what's in it, you don't you don't know if there's like parasites in this or dirt or bacteria, like you don't know what's going on here. But from a natural standpoint, this is natural and this is processed. Like that is the marketing that they're selling you. They're making this sound good for no benefit whatsoever. So naturopaths are also not trained at the level of traditional physicians, but they are taught that they are. They are given countless like pamphlets and this is the same like um like propaganda and information packets this is the exact same thing that naturopaths take to like congress and state legislation and they lobby for rights to treat people without a supervising doctor they try to be established as primary care physicians they try to lobby to let themselves be called doctor they use these pamphlets that outline their course syllabi next to a medical school syllabi, and they use just enough similar names and class credits to make it sound like they're getting the same education. They are absolutely not. Britt Marie Hermes is a former naturopath who saw some really terrible, just generally like poor ethical practices in her clinic, totally outside of naturopathy. Like it wasn't like a clinical decision thing. It was just some things she saw in her clinic that she was like, this is not right. I got to get out of here. 
So she's thinking, I am trained at the level of a physician. She was taught this. She was trained this. She really thought she did. She left the practice, ended up leaving the U.S. Her husband was at a university in Germany. She goes and joins him. She says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll enroll in a master's degree in microbiology. Now, if you had somebody who was trained as, as a physician, they've had undergrad in STEM, they've had these four years of medical school, there might be some gaps where, you know, maybe there's certain things outside of the scope of clinical medicine that you might study as a microbiology major, but it would be a pretty normal transition. She went to her first day of classes, came home and cried. She looked at her husband and she says, I have no idea what they're talking about. These are the people who think that they are trained as physicians and are lobbying for rights to treat people. And the problem is when they see somebody, it stops them from going to a physician and it can delay their care and turn something that's easily curable into something that's terminal. There are many, many studies proving that homeopathy, which is the pharmacology of naturopathy, does not work. The idea of homeopathy is that water remembers what was in it. So if you had, I guess, you know, some sewer water that had been cleaned millions of times, how is the water going to remember the active ingredient you put into it instead of like the sewage, right? Like there's no logic there. Like water could remember anything on earth. The process of mixing up a homeopathic substance is to take one drop of the active thing, put it in water, and then take one drop of that put it in water and just do that hundreds of times. It's just water. Homeopathic remedies are just water. When you see a concentration on the side of the bottle, that's how many times they've taken one drop from a bottle and put it into a bottle of water. That's literally all it is. On the other hand, which is ridiculous because homeopathy is no dose and it's so safe because it's, you know, not strong. Many naturopaths prescribe high dose vitamins and supplements. It's kind of ridiculous, right? Adding high doses of vitamins to your diet is correlated with an increased risk of premature death. It's too much of a good thing. It's just simple homeostasis. It's not natural to eat the equivalent of 14 cantaloupes in a day. So taking a supplement that's equal to 14 cantaloupes in a day, it just doesn't work out. In addition, naturopathy and its specialties are completely unregulated. They self-regulate. There are no guidelines for best practice or safety, meaning they do whatever they want. If somebody else in a naturopathic path practice, like within the United States, I think if it's two people, decide that a certain intervention works, then anybody can just do it. They're like, that's the standard of care now. For example, they have been known to treat cancer with an intravenous solution of baking soda, which is not only harmful, but it delays treatment for a cancer that might've been easily curable. Um, Britt Marie Hermes, there's another story of her and a colleague, she, Britt, Marie saw what she thought was cancer and said, we need to send them to a real doctor, not a real doctor, but she said, we need to send them to an MD, to an oncologist. Her like senior doctor in the practice said, I don't think so. I think it's just anxiety and treated her with supplements and they watched her die from this cancer. And they, she was like dying in the hospital and Britt Marie Hermes heard her colleague say, I need to go fix her chart so it doesn't look like we didn't know it was cancer. Like that is just so unethical. And that's the risk you run. Supplements slash vitamins. So the supplement industry in brief is completely unnecessary and only exists for profit. Supplements are only loosely regulated due to the DSHEA, which is the Dietary Supplement um, and something act um, from, I believe, 1994. It was designed to, um, to really rein in these supplements. Because if you think about supplements and, and things, you're thinking all the way back to snake oil. Like this has always been a thing. And in 1994, we said, we've got to get a hold on this. But the problem was these supplement companies were so rich at this point. And if you ever studied the Affordable Care Act, that's kind of what happened too. The insurance companies were so rich. And the problem is when you're that rich, you just buy votes. And what you do is you run 
you run the marketing campaigns of the people in Congress, the people in the house who say they'll vote for you. And you literally like you market until you get them that seat and then they vote for whatever you want. It is so ridiculous. Um, so because of this, this, this law was very crippled because of their financial pull. Supplements to the surprise of many, if not most people are not tested before they are sold. Companies self-report what's in their products. And if an ingredient is new, it is tested for safety on its own. I could literally go into my backyard and scoop up some dirt and put it in capsules and say it was something and then go through the approval process and sell a supplement. Companies have historically lied and dangerous substances such as prescription drugs have been found in supplements. The um, link to this one, number five, all of these are in the speaker notes for you guys to see later, but there's a whole database of things that have been found in supplements. It is ridiculous. The FDA, this one is the one that makes me the most upset. The FDA is only allowed to test supplements after they have been reported to have serious side effects to determine if they should be pulled off the market. That's the only time they're tested. People have needed liver transplants from supplement use. Like this is nothing to play around with. There are a few supplements that are legitimate. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Fish oils, vitamins when you have a deficiency, red rice yeast extract, which is really interesting if you look into it, um, prenatal vitamins, and a few others. There are a few. So if you do, if you're told by your doctor, you need to take a supplement, you need to take a vitamin, there are two third-party tes testing organizations that I know of. They test these um, supplements and they put a seal on them that says what they say is in there is in there. They don't test for safety. They don't test for, is this effective? They do not test for, does this do what it says it does? They just say what's on the label is in here. There's USP and there's NSF. And something that's super encouraging is Walgreens has either had third parties test or has, I guess, probably all of them through third parties, but USP, NSF, and then they tested any and all other supplements that were in their store. So everything at Walgreens, that's a supplement. What's on the label, that's what's in the supplement, which is great. And everybody should start doing that's a, a very good first step, you know. So this is another quote from that book that I quoted earlier, and I'll tell you about it again in a couple slides. So think about it. Half of our prescription drugs are derived from plants, and no one doubts for a minute that drugs have toxic side effects. That is why we insist on rigorous stress testing to separate those with unacceptable toxicity. We must not assume that all risk disappears when plants are sold as dietary supplements for therapeutic purposes. It just doesn't make sense. It's like the digitalis and the flox glove we talked about earlier. It's just not the same, or you know, the cups of water. It's just a less precise and a less accurate. I had a friend ask me once, um, like, why, you know, why are you so against, you know, supplements and things like that? And, you know, the thing is we test all of these and when you go to the doctor and they say, okay, you have high cholesterol, we're going to start you on a statin. Um, my mom is a classic example of this. She went through a whole bunch of different statins. Some of them did not work for her. Some of them worked, but they gave her terrible side effects. And when you're looking at cholesterol drugs, there's a couple different classes. So based on what her reaction was, her doctor was able to say, oh, okay, that's the side effect of this class of drugs. Let's move you to a different class of drugs. See how that works for you. Oh, this class of drugs isn't doing what, like it's not having an effect on your cholesterol. Let's try something else. Or you, well, this one's working really well, but you've got terrible side effects. Let's switch you to another one in the same class, right? You have so many more options. Or if somebody has like an adverse reaction to that, they might have one to another drug. Like you've got so much more data at your fingertips. You've got precise dosing. Um, I know what's in the bottle, right? Like if you have an allergic reaction, I can look at the list of ingredients and say, well, it's that. It's not, you know, who knows what's in the supplement. Um, another thing with supplements is 
they've tested like different batches of it, completely different things. Like one bottle of it is one thing, another bottle of it is another thing. So I, I think it's pretty obvious why you wouldn't want to give your patients and, and dose them with supplements. So there's so much more to this. So, so much more. These are more things um, that just kind of came to mind off the top of my head. Acupuncture, people have punctured lungs and given people like pneumothorax from it reflexology, grounding, IgG food allergies, which are very different from anaphylactic food allergies. These are the sensitivity testing you're hearing about. Applied kinesiology, which has absolutely nothing to do with physical therapy or true kinesiology. That one's ridiculous. Go look it up. Blue light glasses, colds and vitamin C. Linus Pauling is the one who started the vitamin craze. He is like a formal no, former Nobel Peace Prize winner. Like the guy was incredibly smart. And then he just kind of fell down this rabbit hole of, of vitamins and things like that. Chronic Lyme, the star means there's a caveat here. So there's definitely some things going on with people with Lyme disease afterwards. We need to figure it out, but it's not what natural medicine thinks it is. Adrenal insufficiency, um, that's made up. Um, actually, it might be fatigue. One of them one of them's real and one of them's made up. Um, hormone imbalances, um, unless your doctor tells you that you have a hormone imbalance, they're just finding things to tweak with you. Ayurveda, essential oils, herbalists, shamans, coffee enemas, Cancer Treatment Center of America, this one should have a star too. Some of it's normal chemotherapy, but they have like naturopaths on staff. Miracle Mineral Supplement, this one just turns to bleach in your body. It's really ridiculous. Um, elderberry, there's some limited evidence for it, but it's, you don't, don't do it instead of a flu shot, get your flu shot. Echinacea, hydrotherapy, iridology, which is the study, I'm sorry, the study of looking into somebody's iris and like telling them what diseases they have based on like the freckles in their iris. Um, and Dr. Oz, most of the time is also a big fake. Um, so I know that I've inundated you with a lot of things. Um, whenever I get started about this, someone like always just kind of like their jaw drops and they're like, oh my gosh, I did not know about any of this. This is things I've learned over the years. Really great resources. The Sawbones podcast is amazing. Um, the host of it, she's a family medicine doctor in West Virginia and her husband is like a podcaster basically. And they're really funny. It's really easy to listen to. They take different topics, both pseudoscience and just regular medicine, and they trace them throughout history. And they tell you all of the important research along the way. It is my favorite podcast. It's amazing. You'll love them. The second one is this book that I've quoted several times. It's Do You Believe in Magic? Um, and it's where a lot of this content comes from. It is pretty easy reading as well. My mom is not at all a science person and she picked it up and read it cover to cover and was like, her eyes got huge and she was like, Kate, what in the world? I was like, yeah, it's bad. Um, this is an amazing like place to start. And then the Naturopath Diaries, she's got countless interviews and um, her website as well. So I bet a lot of you have questions or some of you are probably too shocked for questions right now. I don't know, did I scare anybody? Go for it. Did it make anybody mad? Nobody? chat. This is wild. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is. Is that kind of what you're all thinking right now? Or are you all just kind of like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of wild. Is there anything that I've like touched on that you want to hear more about? So we have a couple minutes. I have a quick question. Yeah. How would you say that you gently talk to maybe relatives and yeah. other people that, you know, do like for a fact, you know, they say believe in these things? Yeah, it's hard. Um, so there's some research on this and this is kind of what I want to do with my life. Um, yeah, I don't, it's hard to tell your people, your people to stop going to chiropractors. It's bad. Um, 
I would look up the evidence yourself. Um, chiropractors are so bad. I'm sorry. I, I had a patient tell me some things about their chiropractor today and I'm not over it. Um, the things that you have to watch out for are when you try to convince somebody that they're wrong, the first thing that happens psychologically is called the backfire effect. Um, and, or conceptual conservatism is another name for it. So when you say you're wrong, your brain holds onto that idea stronger. So if you're not really careful about how you talk to them, it actually strengthens their belief, which sucks, right? So from the studies I've read, they have to have belief that you are competent in this field. They have to trust you. Um, they have to believe that you know what you're talking about and you have to gently through logic try to undermine and like talk them through it. It's not really like a one-off thing. The problem is, is that alternative medicine psychologically is like really similar to conspiracy theories. And the things that drive people to conspiracy theories are um, from psychology. There's the OCEAN personality traits. It's an acronym. The N stands for narcissism. People who are narcissistic in their personality, they believe that they know best, are the people who are drawn to conspiracy theories because they think they know enough. Um, oh the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah, the Dunning-Kruger effect is also something to look up. I should have put that on here, but it's this curve. Um, I don't have enough time to explain it, but it's a great story where you think you know a lot. Um, and if you just know a little bit, you don't know enough to understand that you don't know at all, right? So right. it's this idea of you just know enough to think you know everything. And that's kind of where a lot of people land too. So you've got to open their mind up to like new ideas, like a little bit at a time until they kind of go, whoa, there's more to this. Um, so slowly through logic. And the other thing that drives people to conspiracy theories and things like that is fear. Um, either fear of the unknown, I don't like what this doctor told me. I don't want to accept it. Um, like people didn't want to accept that we didn't know where COVID came from, right? So they came up with all these conspiracy theories. It's kind of the same idea. Um, and the other problem is once you believe one conspiracy theory, you are more inclined to believe more conspiracy theories. So it's kind of just like this rabbit hole you fall down to, into. Um, the idea is slowly and very kindly, but yeah, I, I can't tell you how much that I'm just like, biting my tongue and it's it's really hard especially when it's somebody who is poor or they have a disease that could be really easily treated and you just like see them being taken advantage of by this whole industry. absolutely yeah it's hard yeah thank you so much yeah anybody else yeah the vitamins is crazy yeah everybody thinks vitamins are just like great yeah, they don't know. Um, this is something like a lot of people don't know about all of this. Um, actually, my mom's doctor <laughs> tried to put her on a supplement that is the same. That's the red rice yeast extract. It's the same as um, now like a uh, rosuvastatin, I think. Um, it works the exact same way. And my mom failed rosuvastatin and it's the exact same mechanism of action. It's just a little bit weaker. And I was like, why would he put you on that? That's ridiculous. But um, the there's like, yeah, that is so sad, Leah. Um, there's like so much data out there and that's kind of where your predatory journals come in too, that I don't think a lot of the people who've been in practice for a while, like know how easy it is to get proof for anything published. Um, I don't think they, I don't think they have the time either to really get into it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, my journal club. There's one more slide here. Thanks. Um, this is my journal club. Everybody's welcome. Doesn't have to be just a non-traditional stuff. Um, we actually have covered some of these studies on conspiracy theories and stuff like that and this idea. Um, so this is my journal club. Thank you so much for asking me about that. Um, it's for pre-meds of all levels, all backgrounds to learn how to read, analyze, and present current articles to their peers. We are a very like non-gunner group. Like nobody's out there to impress each other or, you know, criticize each other or bring anybody down. We're a really fun group. Tina can vouch for that. 
um, we are like two Sundays um, a month. It's pretty much every other, some variation with holidays. And we do it through Google Meet for about an hour, sometimes less than that, depending on it. Each article is divided into four different jobs. So it's really not that much work. Um, and if you don't have any experience doing this, we'll pair you up with somebody who knows what they're doing. It's not a huge deal. And if you mess up, it's not a big deal. We're there to help you. Like we are there to teach you how to do this. Um, so each person is responsible for one to three and there's one bigger job. That person's kind of more like two to six slides whenever you are the one presenting. After the presentation, members discuss the paper and the findings and we just kind of talk about it. Um, attendance is only required if you're one of the ones presenting that day and participation is required once per two months. And that's just one of the jobs. So you could do literally one slide for every two months. And there is a registration here, link at the bottom. I'm gonna send you guys all a link to this slideshow right now. So you have all of these resources. And, um, there's a registration link there if you want to go into Google Forms and it will, I think it automatically, I got it to work the other day, it should automatically send you an email with like links to get into all of our journal club folder and stuff like that. Our next meeting is, let me look, I think it's the 25th or 24th. That's not a Sunday. <laughs> I think it's the 28th. I think that the biggest thing is about this is like, I remember when I, I think the naturopath dryers is one of the first things I read. And my mom had taken me to a holistic medicine specialist when I was a teenager. And I thought it was fine. Like I thought it was normal. Um, like I believe some of this stuff, but um, I think over the years, just finding it out for myself, um, reading was a really good way to kind of figure it out, figure out I was wrong because there's nobody there pressuring you. So reading would be a good way to try to convince somebody, I think too. Um, but just kind of like slowly over the years, like I, I read stuff on this all the time and it like never ceases to amaze me, like what I used to believe and how much of it there is. Like there's just so much out there. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Tina. Mostly I just get mad at the authors for not designing better papers. That's pretty much half the meetings. If you guys aren't in the uh, Tina's journal club um, with the pre-med scene, we have a great time and I'm, I help her out with that. Oh good, one of you already registered. Look at that. I'm looking up our next meeting. It is the 28th. But yeah, go ahead, Dia. Yeah, so we are approaching time. Um, so if, does anyone have any last minute questions? If not, um, I would just like to thank you, Kate, for sharing your journey and your advice, your expertise. This was such an interesting session. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed it and it was an honor to have you here. I'm glad. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Um, so once again, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And for those of you that are new here to the pre-med scene, I'm putting our link tree in the chat. Um, you can join our group me there, follow us on Instagram, all of our socials um, for more events like this.